Welcome to Fully Exposed, a podcast that explores the taboo and unconventional in an attempt to educate your ass. I'm your host, Jessica Biker. Let's get started. Hi, welcome back to Fully Exposed. I'm here today with our guest, Adam Christie. Adam is an actor, writer, director, and he recently released a seven-part web series called Mano. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Adam. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Today we're here to talk about anorexia, but more specifically, male anorexia and the intersections between masculinity and eating disorders. Before we dive right into the heavy stuff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Adam? Oh, such an easy question to answer. <laughs> um, so I'm from Toronto. I'm an actor and a writer, and I like to dabble in directing, but... um. Yeah, I'm really boring. My friends say I have the lifestyle of a 65-year-old man. <laughs> I read a lot and drink tea, and I'm in bed by 9 because I wake up at 4.30 every day, and I just, like, oh live God. life. Yeah, that's about it. That's literally the extent of me. That's all you need to know. Yeah, that's it. Why are you up at 4.30 every day? I like to write in the morning before everyone else is awake. There's, okay. like, some magic in the air when you know that you're basically the only one out there. When you go for a walk at like 5.30 or whatever, and it feels like the apocalypse because no one's there. <laughs> and as soon as people start going to work, I'm like, okay, it's time to just like go home if I'm out. But usually just writing and reading. And I don't start, like I don't really start my day until like 9.30, but I like those hours in the morning where I could just like pretend like the world is mine kind of thing. That sounds really nice. I also feel like that takes a lot of commitment though. Yeah, you, it takes a while to get into that cycle of waking up at 4.30. And if you have to stay up to like a normal hour of night, like 10.30 to me will be like, that's like two in the morning, basically, <laughs> yeah. All right, so I have a lot of questions regarding the implications of masculinity um, and of mental health in general and how that affects the way that we function and are treated within society. But first, I think it's important for people to truly understand what exactly anorexia is and how it can take over your life. So could you describe for me in as much detail as possible your personal experience with the illness um, starting right at the beginning? Okay. Hmm. Another easy question. Here you go. <laughs> um, so I was, I think, around eight or nine. It was really, really, really wow. early. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know that I had it until I was probably 15. Um, you don't know what an eating disorder is when you're that young, but I just started playing with starvation because it made me feel better. I was overwhelmed by emotions, raised in a family that was like very British and like you can't express what you're feeling. You're just supposed to swallow it down. Um, no pun intended, <laughs> but... Um, so yeah, I just I started by like throwing my lunch out at school and then going all day without eating and feeling just this high and then I'd come home and eat dinner and and then it progressed to skipping breakfast and and lunch and then only eating dinner and then by the time I was like 14 I was going all day without any food. Um but we had a health class in grade 7. So you're like 13 or something, yeah. something like that. And we, we literally were taught that anorexia was an illness that affected teenage girls who wanted to be thin. And that's what it was. Oh my gosh. And that was the definition. So I'm like, that kind of sounds like what I have with the not eating part, but I'm not a teenage girl and it's not because I want to be thin. So I guess there's nothing wrong with me. I'm totally fine. Um, and then I went a bit further into life and then I realized, oh yeah, it is the same thing. That was a wrong definition of it. And, um... It, can, it got pretty bad when I was 16, 17. It was like my worst. Um, almost died a bunch of times and didn't, thankfully. Um, but then around 18, 19, I slowly started to get better, relapsing and getting better. But it never got to the point where I was needing to be hospitalized anymore. Um, and then around 21, it kind of went dormant for four or five years and then it keeps sneaking back in but now I have the the tools that I can sort of see when it's coming and I can utilize the resources that are available and, and keep it at bay um yeah that's a nutshell <laughs> right so what if you don't mind me digging really deep here go for it do those like really low moments look like you said you've almost died a couple times that's um 
obviously very extreme and, mm-hmm. and most people probably don't have those experiences. Um, so to somebody who's never really gone through what you've gone through, like what, what exactly did that look like if you could show us rather than tell us? You mean like the darkest periods of it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I should say that for me, I'm not speaking for everyone, obviously, but for me, it was mm-hmm. more of an addiction. It became something that I was just, I couldn't stop. And your brain becomes a different brain as well. So you're not thinking with, like I wasn't thinking as Adam, I was thinking it was like anorexic Adam. So there was nothing that I wouldn't do for, to protect that part of myself. And in a way, you know you're getting sicker it's so complicated. You know you're getting sicker, but you're happy about it because it's, I describe it as like this, um, this parasite kind of that takes over your brain. The parasite has to take over your body to live and it wants to stay alive. So you can't necessarily be like, I know this is wrong. I know I should get help because that bigger part of your brain is saying like, no, 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 get sicker, get sicker. Um, so when I was at my worst, I went to my doctor for something unrelated and she took my blood pressure and she just like looked at my body and she knew something was off so i think i was 16 at that time and she sort of cornered me and asked me and i just was straight up about it to her and she was the first person that i ever told just because i felt like i had to and um from then i started seeing her every friday after school i would go on once a week um for blood tests and she'd check my heart rate and all that kind of stuff to make sure i was alive but she was also weighing me every week. And in my mind, it became like a competition. So every Friday when I would go, I'd be like, okay, well, I have to weigh less than I weighed before. Just, it was like, it wasn't so much about the way that I looked. It was more so just the number on the scale. Like, uh, oh, I'm a failure if I'm not lower than I was last time. Um, but there was one day where I went and I hadn't eaten for like four days. And then I had, I remember specifically three Subway cookies and a bottle of water. And then I took a hundred laxatives. Oh my God. um, And I just felt like I was dying. My heart was racing. I just, I was gray. I had a test in school the next day. So I had to go. Um, It took me two hours to walk to school and it was a 15 minute walk. I just like couldn't move. When I got to school, I couldn't open the door to go inside because it was too heavy. I had to wait till someone came in and let me in. I did my test and then I was sent home. So I went straight to the doctor, took another two hours to walk there. And when I got there, she did all the tests, but then um, I couldn't open the doors to leave and she wouldn't open them for me. So she's like, call your mom and like your mom will come and she'll open the doors for you and then you can go home. She's like, I'm not keeping you here. Like the doors are unlocked. You can leave whenever you want. And she just, she just stayed there until I just was finally like, fine, call my mom. And she called my mom and she told her everything that was happening. And um, my mom took me to the hospital and um, they wanted to admit me into a program But the weird thing was at the time, it was a week after my 17th birthday and the cutoff for sick kids was 16 and under and um, uh, Toronto General was 18 and up. So there was that one year where there was just no treatment available because of my age and no one was willing to sort of like, I think it's probably been changed by now where like that- I would hope so. Where that one year fits into probably sick kids, but they were like, sorry, nothing we could do, nothing we could do. Like try back when he's 18. And um, so I just went home and tried different treatments that wasn't the hospital at that point. But when you were going through this and like you said, it takes two hours to walk a 15 minute walk. You can't open a door. Clearly your body is is failing on on more than one level Mm. at that time when your body just felt like shit. Was your mind still saying like, no, you're winning, like you're doing the right thing? yeah like in terms of like agreeing with the illness kind of thing yeah wow it's a completely different brain like i can't even describe it it's like this evil monster that just lives inside of your head you know like the the idea of like the good voice and the bad voice on your shoulder it's like that bad voice being like keep going don't quit keep going you got this and it won't shut up until like it literally kills the host which is you so So that time in the doctor's office, that was the first time that your mom knew that something was wrong? Yeah. Well, she claims that she didn't know. And I remember in the office sitting there being like, but you knew, right? Like you had suspicion, right? Because I lost, I think, 70 pounds in like six months, something like that. And she's like, no, I had no idea. Like I was, 
I think my at that point I think I was 96 pounds oh my goodness yeah did anybody in your life your teachers or your friends or anybody else ever say anything to you or did they kind of just normalize it um I think it was one of those things that they politely ignored guidance counselors thought I was on drugs because I was so thin and I was a boy so they're like oh it must be drugs it can't be anything else so I would get sent down to the guidance office we had a social worker that worked in the school and she'd be like you're on drugs aren't you like we, you're, people are telling us that you're taking drugs i'm like i'm not on drugs They're like then why what's happening and i'm like nothing i'm fine um i had some classmates that weren't necessarily friends but i would just like sit next to them like alphabetically or whatever and they would ask questions like i remember i was thinking about this last night there was one guy that just leaned over to me and he's like do you think you could go a full week without eating and I just like, like, what a weird question. And like thinking, why would he ask that? But realizing like, oh, like people know, they can look at you and see that there's something wrong. But, but nobody's actively talking about what that means. Yeah, exactly. Politely ignore it. What has your recovery process looked like? I, I mean, if nobody else was really saying anything, I'd imagine it was kind of something that you just had to act upon yourself Mm -hmm. as you mentioned you were the one that that made took the steps to go to the doctor was there something that kind of went off in your mind that said okay i need to go i need to go see a doctor because something's not right and like how was that struggle i guess between your normal mind as and your the one that was kind of taken over by this parasite as you called it was Mm. there quite a bit of a battle there yeah it's a never-ending battle pretty much but once you get to that point where you're somewhat in the middle of that you get your logical brain back and you can kind of force yourself into that side of of getting healthy um for me at that point i started doing an outpatient program um just during the day i would miss school and go to the hospital instead and i was in a program with a bunch of women all women most of them were in their 30s and 40s and i'm like this teenage boy so that was a struggle but um it was more so just like a refeeding program, I guess, getting weight on you. And once that was done, there's group therapy and whatnot. But once that was done, I was kind of able to to sit down with myself and be like, this is up to you. If you go down that route again, you're going to die. And I just, I, I wanted to live. So I'm like, okay, like I will fight really hard and I will, um, again, like utilizing resources and, and therapy, <laughs> a lot of therapy helps, but um, it's definitely a process. It's always a process, and I know I'll have to watch out for it until, like, the day I die, but... Yeah. What have some of these resources looked like? You've mentioned... You mentioned briefly there was the group home with all the women Mm. and um, other programs. What about, I guess, resources from home? Now that people were actually able to not click the ignore button anymore... Did you, were you able to get support from friends and family? The support that I got from my family was odd. They really thought that the eating disorder was just about eating, which to me, like it was, that was the result of deeper psychological issues. So they'd see me eat a meal and they'd get like a smile on their face. Like, oh, we did it. We saved him. But it's like, there's still the issues going on. Like if I was old enough to drink at eight or nine like i probably would have just become an alcoholic or something you know it was just that's what i had available was the starvation to deal with my pain i guess or whatever you want to call it but yeah they and again it's like we never fully had an open conversation about it it was just sort of just we'll eat and we'll take him to his appointments and then we'll ask him how he went and he'll say good and we'll say good and that will be the end of that um friends again they don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable so they just they just ignore it basically yeah but the resources i would put in the work with the doctors and with the groups and whatnot and that was i guess enough for me i'm not sure of any exact stats but um we touched on this a little bit saying that you know, it went largely ignored for so long because even in health class, you were taught this is something that affects teenage girls. Um, I even, I Googled, uh, I was doing some research on anorexia and one of the like 
Google questions that pops up was, can men get anorexia? So it's something that a lot of people seem to be in the dark about. How do you feel that these assumptions are, I guess, altered or affected by the way that we've constructed masculinity and femininity? Hmm. That's the thing. It's like the statistics that are even online, I think, are low. Because mm-hmm. in order for them to get proper statistics, people have to, men have to admit to it. Right. And to admit to something that is regarded as a female illness, they think it's going to make them weaker or something, as if being, having it be considered, a, I don't even know how to phrase this. It's just, it's a psychological illness that doesn't just discriminate based on gender. It's like saying, oh, only women get bipolar disorder and like men don't. But I think it's probably like more, not necessarily anorexia, just anorexia, but bulimia, like eating disorders, not otherwise specified. Like athletes, a lot of, I know a lot of athletes that have eating disorders that don't even realize that what they're doing. I'm not answering your question because I don't even think I know how really. Um, Well, one of the things, what am I guess my theories is that it all kind of ties down to this issue of image Mm. and how we've kind of constructed how women are supposed to look and how men are supposed to look. And there's always been this idea that men are supposed to be very physically fit Mm. and strong. And I feel like that kind of plays a lot into it because, you know, if a, if a young girl gets anorexia it's almost like there's something to blame it on it's like oh well yeah look at the media the Mm. media kind of tells you you have to be thin and you have to be this but there's it's almost like there's no where to pin the blame if if it's within if if like if a man has anorexia because people feel like they don't get that same the same pressure that same pressure those same pressures in society which uh, they do. Mm-hmm. They definitely do. I do. Th- I definitely think it's harder for women, for sure. There's exactly one body type that's considered attractive from the media towards women. And men, there's maybe two or three. But we all see the same Abercrombie billboards and everybody's yeah. like, this is what you're supposed to look like. We still see it too. Those rock hard abs and like the muscles. It's just, yeah, it affects us all, I think. But it is a disease as well. So you can't necessarily blame a disease on something, I think, right. in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it probably doesn't help to have all of those images and then not have those outlets because people don't even think that that can exist for you. So mm-hmm. how can you possibly, you know, tell somebody this is what I'm struggling with when they don't even acknowledge that that's like a real thing that can happen? Mm-hmm. Would you say, because you are an actor, um, I'm not sure how long you've been an actor for, but I, I would assume that these types of image pressures are that much greater in the acting community has that in any way influenced you it's weird i've never felt the pressure up until probably the last like three months or something the industry's changing a lot and um you look at the people on tv now and yes everyone has always been beautiful on television but everyone not everyone, but most people still had like real bodies back in the day. Mm -hmm. And now you look at people on television and it's not the case. You have people with rock hard bodies. And then like on shows, like, I don't even know shows where they're like surgeons, like Grey's Anatomy, for example, it's like, where do you have time to spend at the gym when you're working for like the characters are at work for like 60, 70 hour (laughs) weeks. And then they take off their shirt and they're like rock hard. It's like, are we not going to explain where they got this magical body from where they're (laughs) like working all the time? It's just, but now I feel the pressure, especially because I'm older. I started acting as a teenager. um, And you're still considered a kid, I guess. But now that I'm moving into man territory, I'm small. I have a small frame and I'm not really working as much because it's like, I can't play grown-ups and i can't play teenagers and i just because i think of my body um i'm never gonna be that like kind of physique so now i'm feeling the pressure but and i'm also super stubborn so i'm trying to be like 
well, screw that. If they don't want it, then whatever. But it's also like, there, it, if it is the standard, you either have to follow the standard or find something else to do with your life. Humans have what I would say is a really primal relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we need it for survival. In It's a form of comfort. In a lot of cultures, it even ties families together. Absolutely, yeah. Other mental illnesses such as alcoholism or drug addiction um, see those that are in recovery completely eliminating those things from their lives, yes. right? You get a chip if you're 100 days alcohol-free. With food, you can't eliminate food because we need it for survival. So how has your relationship with food changed throughout your illness and your recovery? That's such a good question because when I was at that point of like 18 years old trying to transition out of a fully eating disordered brain that was what i would say a lot it's like well i can't just stop eating altogether it's not like alcohol or heroin i can't just quit it and then have it be in the past yeah. you have to find a balance um and you have to start to love your relationship with food again i guess there's certain foods that i still can't eat because they would be like binge foods and i'm scared that if i go down that route route Route? Route? Route. Route. <laughs> if I go down that way, then I won't be able... I'm scared that I might not be able to pull myself back. Um, but more so for me, the triggers are like... Like if I get too hungry. You know, like if I'm working or something and I miss a meal and then I feel... You know, when you're like so hungry, you just want to shove everything in your face. Yeah, totally. Like if I get that hungry, that's something that can really trigger me off. And then I'll be like, oh, this feels so good and bad, but also good. Um, but yeah, you just have to find a, a balance is the best word for it. Cause like you said, you can't just stop eating, but you just have to have healthy behaviors with your eating and just, I don't know, admit to yourself when what you're doing is wrong, not wrong as in like unethical, but wrong as in like unnatural for humans, I guess. Right. So how hard were those routines to implement back into your life after not eating for so long and, and practically starving yourself was it really hard to say okay now i need to eat you know three meals a day yeah incredibly challenging i remember the first meal that i had after getting out after first telling my mom about it literally sobbed into my food and i'm like well now i have to eat this and it's covered in my tears and it's just like extra salty now because of it but it took you literally cry over your food as you force it into your body it just feels like you're filling a void, but you want the void. And filling the void, you're scared that like, there's a line in the series where it's like, he equates it to being like his best friend. Because you can't, it is your best friend. It's with you all the time. And you're slowly mm -hmm. killing your best friend to get your brain back. Um, so the initial transitions into being healthy again were very, very challenging. But again, it's just all conflicted emotions because you know you have to, but you don't want to. And you reach a point where it's like, well, it's easier if I'll just die, but then you don't want to die. But it's, yeah, it's, again, I'm just speaking for myself, but it was brutal, 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 brutal. But you get there and you're better for it eventually. <laughs> Let's talk about the series. Okay. So you recently created a series called Mano, which you wrote, directed, and starred in. The film explores the life of a young actor who is also going through with struggles of anorexia. On the surface, the series sounds like it could be bi uh, biographical, but you have said that it's inspired by, but not a mirror to your life. So I'm curious to know what are some of the biggest differences between real life you and the character that you play in your series? Well, the only real similarities, I guess, is... Mm. are the experiences in terms of uh, like the insight i guess into the illness but aside from that it's a character and he is completely fabricated and there's not much of me in the actual character it's just the insight into the illness where i felt like i could create something um i didn't want to make a straight up documentary about myself because that's really boring and i didn't want to spend that much time with myself but I still wanted to tell the story. Um, there are certain elements in the series. I wanted him to be surrounded by females. The only other males seen on screen are children. 
I don't have younger brothers. Um, I don't have gay parents. He has lesbian moms and I don't. Um, I, I didn't even want to make him an actor, but I wanted him to have a quote unquote feminine job. And I thought that that would be a stereotypical feminine job in terms of like having to go to work and like put on makeup and all of these things in the opening sequence, he's putting on makeup because he has an audition and I wanted it, him to be very, um, into his appearance, I guess. And not that he is naturally just, you have to be when you're an actor because you're walking into a room to like have people look at you and critique you. So he had to be on that. But, um, yeah, there's not much in terms of similarities, I guess. Was that an intentional decision? Like, did you want to keep those two lives separate? I did, but only just so I wouldn't get bored, really. Mm-hmm. I just didn't want to tell my own story because it's like, I lived it. I don't want to live it again. It's boring to me. Maybe someone else might find it interesting, but I thought that telling it this way would be a little bit more, I don't know, interesting, I guess is the only word. I don't know. Would you say that making the series was cathartic in any way or on the reverse of that did i know that he the character has a much different life and experiences than you but did bringing these issues up was that hard to do yes b i'm gonna go with b on that one um (laughs) it wasn't overly cathartic because i felt like i had worked out all of the issues as far as i was going to work them out up until that point on my own So there wasn't really anything that I felt like I needed to get out or work through. Um, And, you know, I didn't even expect it to be challenging. And it wasn't when we were shooting, but after um, writing, I tweaked one of the voiceovers in the second episode. Second episode? Yeah, in the second episode, I tweaked one of the voiceovers and I was just sitting there like stream of conscious writing. And then I'm like, oh, wow, this is actually like, I felt like I was triggering myself kind of just by writing this but it was only one day writing the voiceover but um yeah it was challenging in that sense and then watching it back actually once it was completed was a little bit hard um it's a bizarre thing when you see someone mm, this is a tough thing to say but when you see someone that is ill still in that way you get a little jealous like you know that you're better and you're healthy and you're better for it but like you look back and i look back at that time and this is an awful thing to say but i look back at that time in my life when i was 16 17 with fondness i can't explain it it was just like it was comforting kind of knowing that i was living life but not really living life because i was so absorbed with this thing so i felt untouchable kind of and you were well, and you were feeding one very real part of your brain, as you've mentioned. That part is always going to live inside of you. Yeah, but when you're in that state, you're not thinking of anything else. You're not thinking of your relationships or school or the future or your goals. You're just every single day thinking of this one thing. And looking back on it, it's it's comforting because now as grown ups, we know that we have to like think about our bills and like our futures and our careers and all that. And it it can be exhausting. So sometimes I look back and I'm just like, huh? Hmm. And I know that's awful. And it's, if anyone who's listening has an eating disorder, they might not understand or they might completely be like, yeah, I get that. I might not want to admit it, but I get it. Yeah. Did you, when you were going through, I guess like the lowest lows, did that affect the way that you were, relationships would function I guess I just think like when a really common thing if my friends want to get together it seems to always be like oh let's go out for dinner you know let's go Mm. for appetizers and drinks and I'm just curious to know how people how your relationship still functioned when you were going through that did people start treating you differently did you notice that your friendships that your relationships with your parents changed at all yeah, I became very isolated just because it was easier, I guess. Um, and you do become very skilled at lying. You have to to sort of protect this thing that you're going through. Um, and yeah, everything was sort of surrounded around food. So I would either make sure I wasn't there for dinner. Oh, I'm late at school and we ordered pizza at rehearsal or something. Or when you're going out for friends, it's like I ate right before I left the house kind of thing. But you just, you learn the tricks to keep your secret but at the same time you feel really guilty for lying so you start to remove yourself from situations and just i spend a lot of time alone just 
feeding into this thing. Yeah. Did you have anyone in your life that almost tried to like force you to eat that was like, no, you're going to sit down and you're going to eat a meal or were you completely isolated from that as well? Like I said, I was very good at lying. <laughs> and also when I was at home, I did this weird thing where I had this sheet, like a bed sheet and I would wrap it around my body every time that I was in the house. Like if I was in pajamas, I would wrap the sheet around my body. So I realized that like people might not have even seen how thin I was at home. And we wouldn't eat meals together, which was a big thing. We would make dinner and then we would all go separately and eat our meals. And I would take my meal up to my bedroom and just like put it in Ziploc baggie so I could throw it out at school the next day. So no one, the food was still like, I was still eating the food. I'm doing air quotes. No one can see I'm doing air quotes. <laughs> I'm doing air quotes. I was still eating the food, like taking it up and bringing down a clean plate. So people at home weren't people at home. My family, I know it's a weird, it just sounds weird. My family didn't really notice until I told them. But friends, yeah, no one sat me down and was like, you need to eat. No one really, none of my friends really wanted to talk about it. It's awkward, I guess, for people. But I had a friend who had an eating disorder at the same time, and I would talk to her about it. Oh, really? I would talk to her about her eating disorder, but not, your but own. not my own. Yeah, she was another one that thought that I was on drugs because of my weight. It was a very bizarre relationship, yeah. Did you give her advice about her eating disorder or did you just like, kind of listen to the things that she was going through like how to get it when you say advice the eating disorder brain comes out like advice like get sicker advice like here's some tips or advice of like how to get better i guess both um i would give it not in how to get sicker because like i would see that she was really struggling and she was struggling more in the side of like it was a thinness thing for her she did want to lose weight to be thin i feel weird talking about this because it's not my story but i won't say her name or anything um me and a friend we actually ended up i don't know how to say this she was really unhealthy at this point so we ended up oh god i don't want to say it because it sounds awful when i tell the story but we like sort of entrapped her i guess where we um recorded a phone conversation where she was threatening suicide and and we just showed it to the social worker and that day she, her parents came and took her away and she just didn't come back to school because they were able to get her into a program at sick kids where she spent nine months in hospital and she got better from it but it's just the way that we went about it we did it to help her but it felt like we were just like throwing her to the wolves kind of thing but she got better and she's She's doing great now, so I don't know. It's a weird story, I, but... There's kind of a weird juxtaposition with that is you almost kind of feel like you're betraying someone. Absolutely, but yeah. But sometimes there's no other way. Sometimes you don't know how to reach a person. Yeah, it's still, it's the betrayal that feels... Like, yeah, she got better, and I don't know if we were the reason why she was able to get into the hospital, but it was sort of the catalyst i guess that started her down that road but it is the betrayal thing mm -hmm. that's still like it's i can still feel it just talking about it it's it's strange you mentioned that her eating disorder stemmed from like a body image issue mm -hmm. which was different from yours um i guess to go back right to the beginning what do you think it was that I guess kind of spurred yours on? You said it, it happened when you were eight or nine and that it wasn't really, it wasn't influenced by your acting career. It wasn't influenced by this, um, you know, need to look skinny or look a certain way. Do you have any insight into what it was that kind of spurred that on for you? I think so. After years of like reflection, um, I'm just a very emotional person in general. Um, I feel everything very deeply. And when you're that young, we don't teach our kids about their emotions. They just have them and we're just quiet about it and they don't understand and they're confused. So I feel like that was a big part of it. And then my dad died when I was around that age. So I feel like that was another, another big trigger because we didn't talk about that either. He just passed away mm -hmm. and then we dealt with that. And then it was like, okay, we won't talk about it again. Um, and yeah, just being left alone to deal with all your issues when you're a kid and you have no tools for that, it's, and that's what it was. That's what I had available was the starvation. Like I said before, I couldn't turn to drugs or alcohol or anything like that. So it was to kill the bad feelings in myself. 
It's one thing that you can kind of control. Yeah. Going back to the series, one of the things that we see in the series, um, but also that I've personally seen in my own life regarding different mental illnesses is a universal understanding of how mental illness even works. So with people who might struggle with depression, you'll oftentimes hear, oh, we'll just feel better. Or with people who have anxiety, it's, oh, we'll just, you know, leave the house and surround yourself with people. And with eating disorders, it's just eat. It's as simple as that. From your own experience, how frustrating are these comments? and Or how do they affect you? Yeah, they're very frustrating. And I get very sassy. Like, I remember a nurse being like, oh, like, have you tried just, like, eating something? I'm like, oh, my God, thank you so much. Like, I never thought of that. That's so smart. You're I'm a here. genius. Like, perfect. Send me home. Get me a burger. Um, and it's always like, eat a sandwich, which is like, side note, why a sandwich all the of time? All, of all things. Yeah. But um, with depression, going back to depression, they're like, oh, just just feel better. Just have you tried just like being happy or like forcing yourself to be happy? It's just, it's, it's infuriating because it's so condescending and it's coming from people that, I mean, it's, it's slight ignorance, but it's also just like, I don't know how people can think that way. It's, yeah, it's infuriating just the notion of like simplifying something and throwing it at someone just like a little verbal jab. It's, um, yeah, it's enough to make me, not anymore, but I would like hate the person that said it and just write them off completely. It's like, okay, so you're an idiot. We don't need to speak anymore, um, but I'm not that way now. <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't know how else to, it's just, um, if it were that simple, we would do it. Yeah. Depression, especially. It's like, if it w were that simple, it's just like getting out of bed and like whistling and skipping down the street, then like we wouldn't all be so depressed all the time. <laughs> Mental illness wouldn't be a thing if yeah. it was that simple. And another thing is, it's like we don't talk about it enough for it to be destigmatized. Mm -hmm. Mental illness in general. People like, when I even tell people like, oh, I'm going to see my therapist, they'll like, oh, you see a therapist? I'm like, yeah, you don't. And then they'll be like, oh, it's so good of you to like talk about it. Good for you. And it's like, I didn't like run a marathon. I'm just like going to my therapist. Like we should all be doing it. Um, but just the way people are like, oh, really? And then sometimes they'll even get quiet. Like, oh, you do that? It's like, yeah, I'm not ashamed. I love it. It's great. Therapy's awesome. <laughs> I never thought about that before, but it is very much a, like you get a gold medal for taking care of yourself. Yeah. People go to the gym all the time. Why not take care of their mental health yeah. and their physical health? I like to say that we're all mentally ill. Like everyone has something. If you have a human brain, you have some sort of something. something. Not necessarily an illness, but maybe an unwellness, something that you need to take care of. And we just don't. I mean, look at the state of the world with everything. Look at all the violence. It's like, there's a way to get around this. It seems to be more prevalent now too than ever before, just with constantly being plugged in and yeah. surrounding ourselves with a never-ending loop of seeing everybody else's lives, which yes. of course is just a highlight reel. So, yeah, I mean, you don't actually know what's going on with everybody. But... And then your brains are changing. Where our thought processes are just like rapid now, and we're not aware that it's increasing in speed, and we're just all, I feel like, seconds away from exploding mentally. And yeah, definitely is. I guess. <laughs> This is a hard question to ask because I know that's there's not just one answer. Mm. But what do you think? I guess are some ways that we can start as a, as a society or even on an individual level start to work towards a place where we can talk more about mental health, where we can openly say, "I'm going to see my therapist," and not either act like it's something to be ashamed about. Or like you should be, you know, getting a standing ovation for it. Um, basically, how are some ways that we can educate people so that empathy isn't just like an afterthought? Mm. I mean, my answer to that is just it's really basic. Let's just talk about it. Talk about everything. Why are some things off limits in terms of conversation and other things are fine? If we just talk about everything openly and honestly with everybody, then that's at least a way to to get the ball moving in the right direction. Um, yeah, I, I want to say more, but that's really how I feel. It's just, there shouldn't be some things that we talk about and others we're like, shh, 
that's only for certain people to know or like just talk about that at home it's like no like i i meet people like i meet strangers and i talk to them with this i sometimes get in trouble up for this with them actually but i'll talk to strangers the same way that i'll talk to like my best friends because a person's a person like we're making eye contact we're talking and it's like why would i say some things to you but not everything and then say like there's no levels of closeness to me for me you know i just like mm -hmm. i'm open with everyone sometimes i make people very uncomfortable and sometimes <laughs> people are like again they're like good for you but then sometimes people are like oh you're crazy for talking about this stuff but it's just like and that word again crazy it's mm -hmm. like where does that fit in anymore it has like no meaning anymore but people yeah. use it all the time for things that they usually can't understand yeah it's like um what's the word hysteria from hundreds of years ago oh she has hysteria it's like well and people will get diagnosed with like hysteria and it's yeah. like same with crazy oh they're crazy it's like mm, i don't i don't know what that means you mentioned that you have tools that you use to sort of keep yourself in check and just make sure you know that you don't get to that really deep place again i'm wondering if you can just elaborate on what some of those tools are mm. they're very specific to me obviously but it's the biggest one is as simple as checking in with yourself. And I do that through meditation. Sometimes I'll literally just sit in a room with the lights off, not intending to go to sleep or anything. I'll just sit there and think and sort of interview myself, kind of. In my head, not out loud, I'm not like, but I'll just sit there and be like, okay, how am I feeling right now in this moment? How have I been feeling all day? What's causing my anxiety? That's another big, big thing for me is like, when I get anxious, instead of just being like, oh, I feel anxious, I feel anxious, sit and be like, well, why do I feel anxious? What happened? What am I doing that might be feeding into that? So I'll sit there and just sort of process everything um, quietly to myself. It might take 10 minutes, I might be sitting there for two hours. Um, but then active meditation as well and just um, eating the right foods and a support system for me um, as we talked about a lot I have my therapist and um, and just like being open with friends family um, I guess that's pretty much it it's just for me that's that that checklist that I go through in my head right you also mentioned too that there were like triggers or trigger foods that you had are those uh, so those are just things that you like completely avoid yeah do you know kind of why those are your certain triggers or is it just like completely random they were the foods that i would you go so long without eating i would go like literally like four or five six days without any food mm -hmm. and then on that final day i would binge and binge and binge and binge and binge and it would be the binge foods that i would binge on um and I just, I avoid them out of fear that it might, anything can trigger me. Um, like even certain smells I can find triggering. Um, bumping into people that you didn't expect to bump into can be triggering. So I just try to be aware of it. Also, when you get triggered, it's not just one trigger that sort of sets you off. It's like you have to, you get triggered and it's sort of like uh, you go down a road and you're like, okay, I can go down this path, the bad one, or I can go down this path, which will help me get back to the healthy version of myself and you get tested with like okay i have a choice here i could be weak or i could be strong and then you follow whichever one usually i'm strong <laughs> i hope <laughs> wow it's very much it sounds like a just like yeah a constant like mental dialogue absolutely yeah the further down you go the harder it is to get back out um so it's just staying on top of it and just yeah talking to yourself and, and being like it's okay that i'm feeling what i'm feeling in this moment and I can feel it fully and I don't have to, when I'm sad now or anxious, I feel it. I don't try to like, I don't want to be sad. I want to be happy. Like I'll, I'll feel it. I'll let, I'll ride the wave until it's over and then I'll, and then it'll be over. Um, but not trying to force your emotions into only the positive ones. I find for me at least helps. I think that's really helpful for anyone because a lot of our addictions or compulsions, I think come from that trying to avoid emotion right mm -hmm. i mean people binge eating for example a lot of people will do that if they're stressed or if they're mm -hmm. sad you know alcohol another one something you turn to if you are at a really low place or you're depressed or these are we kind of use these tools instead of feeling feelings exactly and that's it like just they're there your feelings are there for a reason we need the good with the bad i always say that like 
if we're happy all the time, we wouldn't even know that we're happy because we don't have anything to compare it to. So we need that wave of like knowing like you're sad right now, you're not going to be forever unless there's like a chemical imbalance in your brain or something and it's like clinical depression kind of thing. But um, yeah, just feel what you're feeling when you're feeling it and know that it won't be forever. I say that all the time too. It's like uh, Inside Out, that Pixar movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have one quick question uh, about the series again. I noticed that it is shot in black and white. Mm -hmm. Was that an intentional decision? Yes. And why? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. It's weird. It was never. It actually was never a decision. I just always knew it was going to be black and white. The general idea is, when I would watch old black and white movies with my grandfather or whatever he loves black and white movies when i would watch them i'd be angry at first like oh it's a black and white movie i can't watch this like i don't i'm not gonna get this but then after watching it for a while your brain starts to fill in the colors on its own and then maybe 10 15 minutes into the movie you see the colors and you feel the colors and that's sort of the same thing and you don't notice that it's black and white and that's how i felt with the eating disorder where it's like your life slowly becomes just hazy black and white dull but you don't notice it because it you transition into feeling that way just the black and white yeah i guess it's just and then your brain starts to fill in the colors and you don't realize that there aren't any colors in your life anymore that it is just this hazy life that you're le leaving leaving leading i was gonna say anyway Whew. um but uh i swear i'm smart you guys <laughs> at least a little bit but um yeah that was it really I just wanted it to to be as dull and hazy as the character would be seeing it and he would be living in a very black and white world if that makes sense yeah totally did you feel i lied i guess i had to, i had another question about the series <laughs> um did you feel that was this something that you actually like sat down and were like, I'm going to write a series and it's going to be about this guy who's an actor and he's struggling with anorexia? Or was it something almost that you felt you had to do? One day did you, it just kind of fell into your lap and you just started writing in it and it kind of snowballed and became what it is today? So both and neither. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that I, I'm working on right now, either things that I've produced already or things that I'm working on right now they're ideas that i've had since i was a teenager so when i was younger i knew that i wanted to tell this story from a male perspective um but it took me like seven years on and off to write this um and every time i would write a draft it would add a new layer to it like initially it was just about a man with anorexia but then i realized there was more there and i started dealing with the whole um I call it a crisis, but the whole crisis of masculinity and where we're at right now. And then all the social media stuff started happening. So that sort of fell into it as well. But it was just sort of like a very layered thing. Every draft I'd write, I'd be like, oh, but I want to talk about this too. And I want to talk about that too. And people would read it and think that I was talking about too much. And they'd be like, oh, you can't make this. It's like, it's not about one thing, which is what I wanted. Like I wanted people, every one that I talked to about this so far, everyone says a line. They're like, oh, this is my favorite line. And everything is different. You know, like no one said the same thing, which is cool because people attach themselves to different parts of it and they relate to that and not others. But yeah, it became, yeah, just very layered and it took time, but it didn't just pour out of me. It took writing it, putting it on the shelf, coming back and just going from there. Going off on what you said about masculinity did obviously while you were going through this you were very thin and therefore didn't have the same traditional now i'm doing the air quotes <laughs> traditional um masculine body image did that add on kind of like another layer of i don't know if i want to use the word oppression but essentially was that something that you were ever like bugged about or that you ever kind of felt like an outsider for is for okay well i'm dealing with this but now on top of that you don't i guess look how you're traditionally supposed to look hmm, that's a tough one i wasn't really or did you just not care i wasn't really like targeted in terms of like people commenting on it because i you could tell by looking at me that i was very ill mm -hmm. that i had an illness and that's why i was that thin so i feel like i was kind of off limits 
in terms of like people picking on me or, or what have you. Um, I think when I slowly started losing weight, I, I did have that like, oh, I want muscles and I'll lift weights. But then once you go through a certain period of that and you just, you're all bone, you're like, okay, well, that's not going to happen for me. Um, and at that point, I just didn't care. I like, I, it was never the whole, um, the whole cliche. Maybe it's not a cliche. I don't know. The whole image of like a really skinny person looking in a mirror and seeing an obese person looking back at them. It was never that for me. Like I'd look in the mirror and I would see the thinness and I'd be like, that's disgusting, but I can't stop. Um, but now <laughs> going back to what we talked about earlier, now I feel the pressure to like, to get the broad shoulders and like the big muscles and, and, and that, that probably is just from the acting. Like if I wasn't an actor, I wouldn't really care what I look like. I should say that I'm not on Instagram, which I feel like really helps having confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I like check in on something on Instagram, I call it Insta anxiety. I feel like someone shoots adrenaline in my heart and I have to get off because it's just like, it's overwhelming. And it's like, that's not healthy. I don't need, I don't need to make myself feel that way. Extremely overwhelming. Yeah. Do you have any social media? Nothing. No. Wow. I use a flip phone and I barely check my email. <laughs> I you check. use a flip phone. That's amazing. It took me over a month to find it because people don't sell flip phones anymore. I would no. go to different stores and I'm like, why do you want a flip phone? It's so hard to text. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. Like, I want something that's just like basic. Yeah. It's super surprising to me, though, being in the industry that you're in. I mean, it's not easy. <laughs> Like, do you, do people get like agitated with that? Yes. Like, oh, you need to have social media. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How do you promote your like projects? You get a publicist. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so with something like this, I should have got social media. Absolutely. I mean, I'm realizing that now and also like a couple months ago, but I just, I don't know. I'm not above. I'm, I know what social media does and I'm not above that idea. Like I know that if I had Twitter, I would be obsessed with Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I would look every day to see how many followers I had. I would like go on Twitter all day, every day. If I had Instagram, I would be on Instagram all day. I'd be, again, be obsessed with like, oh, how many followers can I get? Who's doing what? What's this person that I went to high school up to? Like, it's just like, I would get so obsessed. I'm like, I, I just have that personality and I, I, I don't want to go down that road. But, um, so that's why I don't use it. Well, good for you. It's very hard to not have all of those things, I find, yeah. when everybody else does, because you're kind of on the outside a little bit. People think, again, this word, but like, I'm mentally ill when I don't have it. Or when I whip out oh my, my flip gosh. phone, they're like, are you selling drugs? <laughs> That's a big <laughs> thing I get to. Just What's like, the sketchy burner phone? Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, it, it is a challenge. and But I feel like for my own mental, mental health, I need to mm -hmm. go down this way. Wow, well, good for you. For anyone who's listening, and I mean, we I think we've covered this and through listening to your story, I can start to see a little more and I hope that our audience can that anorexia obviously isn't just like a one size fits all type of thing. Everybody's experience is like wildly different. It's like a thumbprint in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but for anyone listening that may have or may currently be going through um, anorexia or any other eating disorder what support or resources would you recommend to them? Mm -hmm. I am a big fan of Sheena's Place. Okay. Um, that's a big one in Toronto. And far as far as other resources go, that's just my go-to. Mm -hmm. So um, I typically, they do, um, it's not like a inpatient program or anything. You register, they have terms and you register. They have many, many classes, like maybe 30 or 40 different things that are very, they have support groups, they have things that help with meditation. Um, so I always pop in there. I'm actually starting up again next week just to like stay on top of that. Um, so Sheena's Place is a big one. I recommend just like, and I hated it at the time when I was ill, but group therapies, like it's, it's really important. It truly helps to like sit in a room with people they might not be feeling the exact same as you, but they can relate to what you're saying. Um, and again, be open about it with your friends and family. Don't keep it. I kept it a secret for a very long time. Talk about it. Because when you stop talking about it, that's when it becomes more of a problem, more dangerous. Just be open about it. I'm open about it now with everyone. Just And even when I talk about it with people, with friends that I have, that are new friends that didn't know about it back then. They're all still like, can you be talking about that out loud kind of thing? But just do it. 
can't it can't get you if you keep it in the light just don't turn your back on it yeah i think that's why the series is so important because it just feeds into that normalizing it and mm. saying hey it's okay to have these discussions it's okay to it's a it's a hard thing to talk about and it's obviously something that is isn't pretty and i think people tend to shy away from stuff that isn't either a something that they can understand themselves or b that that has any kind of emotion or you know ugliness attached to it Mm. so i think being able to see that in a series and to watch this and say like oh okay this is something that a lot of people are dealing with uh is very helpful so finally where can people watch the series it's on the website which is uh mano.com m-a-n-o.com um it's on youtube i think as well in terms of social media, no. You're out of luck. Out of luck. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what a hash, how a hashtag works. <laughs> um, but yeah, the website, M-A-N dash O. Check it out on YouTube, Man O the Series. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, coming in and, and talking to us about this. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. That's our show. Thanks for tuning in this week to Fully Exposed. I hope your ass has been sufficiently educated. 